So today, since it's Mother's Day, we're celebrating one of the so-called founders of this holiday, the Unitarian named Julia Ward Howe. In 1870, more than 40 years before it became an official U.S. holiday, she issued her inspired Mother's Day proclamation, which we heard in the opening video today. Now, this was Julia's first major feminist act. It was an attempt to launch a women's movement for peace. The time she wrote it, the Civil War was over, but short in memory, or still in memory, still in near memory. It was also the time of the Franco-Prussian War. And Julia started to think about the nature of war itself. She had seen the US Civil War, described it in her battle hymn as a, as a holy war. But now she was struck with the unholiness of war and the ways it could be avoided. She wrote, why do not the mothers of mankind interfere in these matters and prevent the waste of that human life which they alone bear and know the cost? She called on women to initiate a Mother's Day for Peace on June 2nd every year. Unfortunately, the tradi tradition never took permanent hold and it was eclipsed by the official US holiday of Mother's Day established in 1914, which was settled upon the second Sunday in May as we celebrate it today. Now, the thing we know Julia Ward Howe enough you know, for is really writing the words to the battle hymn of the Republic. She was a poet after all, but before I go on and tell you about the battle hymn, this is the book that was the source of the sermon. It's called The Civil Wars of Julia Ward Howe by Elaine Showalter. This is another biography that is very interesting and a quick read and doesn't feel like work. It feels more like a, a juicy novel. Oh, and the reference, uh, The Civil Wars of Julia Ward Howe, um, that is in reference to, yes, the Civil War we all know. The other Civil War was uh, related to her extremely unhappy marriage. More on that later, back to the battle hymn. So Julia Ward Howe was with a contingent of prominent Bostonians traveling to Washington DC in the fall of 1861. This is when the Civil War had been underway for about six months. Her travel companions included her husband, who was a physician and who was appointed to the US Sanitary Commission. Also in the party was the Massachusetts governor, John Andrew, who was an abolitionist and a Unitarian as well, and his wife. And in the party was Unitarian minister James Freeman Clark and his wife, who was the minister to the governor and to Julia Ward Howe, otherwise known as JWH. In Washington, they had the opportunity to visit personally at the White House with President Lincoln. Julia described him as a tall bony figure, devoid of grace, his countenance almost redeemed from plainness by kindly blue eyes. Now, this conversation with President Lincoln was supposedly not that great, but I really do suspect that Lincoln had other things on his mind, apart from talking to a bunch of radical Bostonians. Later on, this same group of travelers from Boston was coming back from Northern Virginia, and they were coming back alongside Union troops, and as they were, they were marching, they were singing army songs. Songs like John Brown's body is moldering in the grave, kind of morbid. But the interesting thing is that this contingent of Bostonians knew John Brown and supported his abolitionist work. Um, and then had to scramble for cover when the raid on Harper's Ferry didn't go so well and John Brown was arrested. Um, but, you know, the song came to the attention of Reverend James Freeman Clark, and he suggested to his friend Julia, who was the poet, that she should write some of her own stirring words to the same tune. She didn't really make much of a commitment, but that evening, the words, she says, came to her in a dream. This could be something she made up to make it a good story. I don't know, but this is what she said. It came to her in a dream and she woke up in the middle of the night, you know, 
desperately trying to record all of these, these verses that came to her to write them down. So on her way back to Boston a couple days later, she showed her verses to uh, Reverend Clark and he liked them. And so soon she sent her poem to the Atlantic Monthly. They agreed to publish it and she received $5 for it. The editor is the one who came up with the title, The Battle Hymn of the Republic. The poem was actually placed on the cover of the February 1882 edition of the magazine and was published without attribution, which was actually a pretty common practice back then. But ever so slowly, the poem turned him took off. It became an anthem for the Union fight against the Confederacy. A year later, Julia was reciting the hymn at the de dedication of a statue of John Brown in Boston. A few months later, the hymn was performed in Washington in the presence of President Lincoln. And a biographer of the, the abolitionist John Brown uh, said that without Julia Ward Howe, John Brown may not have become fused with the American myth. He might not have been remembered as well. She had, he said she had coupled John Brown's God-inspired anti-slavery passion to the North's mission and had thus helped define America. Despite the fact that John Brown is not in the Battle Hymn of the Republic explicitly, but the association with that original song and the hymn together kind of put him in the frame. That was all it really took for that mental connection to be made. Basically, the battle hymn is a story of a holy war to make people free, make enslaved people free. So the proclamation and the battle hymn are the things that Julia Ward Howe is best known for. But I'm going to tell you some more things about her interesting life in a more linear fashion. We'll start at the beginning. So Julia Ward, was not a native Bostonian. She was a New Yorker. She was born in New York City in 1819. Her father was a very wealthy man, although self-made, he was a banker, which made Julia and her sisters New York society heiresses. Julia was tutored at home and at private schools in literature, language, science, and math. She knew French from early childhood, began Italian at 14, added German on there and read in Latin and Greek. She had music lessons and voice training with the finest teachers available. And because of this, as a young woman, she garnered, garnered, garnered the society nickname, the diva. And although her formal schooling was intense, it was over at the age of 16. But really that didn't stop her from continuing to study on her own and which she did through the rest of her life. She studied literature and history and philosophy and really taking to writing. By the time she was 20, she had written literary criticism that was published anonymously again, but it was in the New York Review and other publications. Now, although Julia had this really posh society, wealthy upbringing, tragedy was not unknown to her. Her mother died when she was only five while in childbirth, making Julia really apprehensive in her adult life about pregnancy and childbearing, which was um, some, something was a thing of the time. It was a very scary proposition. After Julia's death, um, young Julia had a, a father who had greater influence in her life. But he was, a, he was a really religious guy, very wealthy banker religious guy. He was a strict Calvinist and he was protective of his children, but not so much, you know, it didn't stop his three daughters of which Julia was the oldest from enjoying high society and high fashion and parties and all of those things. And just to show how high society they, they were, Julia's brother actually married into the Astor, Astor family. Um, Julia and her sisters, they were all beautiful. So in society, they were referred to as the three graces. And Julia was often considered the most attractive. She had auburn hair, blue eyes, and of course she had that beautiful diva singing voice. But tragedy struck again when Julia was 20 years old. And this time she lost her father and shortly thereafter a brother and sister-in-law. So in her grief, Calvinism, which really was never her thing, suddenly became important to her. 
even though she was very well read in more liberal ideas. But um, JWH was saved by her friend in Boston, Mary Ward. Mary Ward was not a relation, just happened to have the same last name. Mary Ward just wasn't having all of this Calvinism with her friend, so she sent her a sermon by the famous Unitarian minister, William Ellery Channing. Julia liked the sermon. While visiting Mary in Boston in 1841, this is really a big pivotal moment in her life, Julia heard William Ellery Channing preach, and she attended a Ralph Waldo Emerson lecture, and she went to one of Margaret Fuller's Boston Conversations. Later, she wrote, I studied my way out of all the mental agonies which Calvinism can, en can engender and became a Unitarian. Yes, um, if you remember from February, the service on Margaret Fuller, the other um, tough Unitarian woman who did a lot in the 1800s, um, Julia's life did intersect with Margaret's. The Boston Unitarian, Com Unitarian Committee was not that big. Um, Julia was nine years younger than Margaret. Um, and um, Julia was not always nice. Initially, when she, when she wrote of her experience at Margaret Fuller's Boston Conversation Group for Women, Julia quipped that they should have been called Margaret's monologues rather than conversations. But JWH was like that. She had no qualms with sh throwing shade on anyone who rubbed her the wrong way or who criticized her. In her later writing, she accused Elizabeth Barrett Browning of being an opium, opium addict, which is actually pretty true, but that was followed with years and years of really awkward social interactions with her husband, Robert Browning. But then again, you know, literary criticism was sort of a blood sport back then. And there were lots of um, big literary egos involved in all of these, you know, this, this written sparring. Also on uh, JW or JW at this point, Julia Ward's Boston visit, she got to hang out with the poet Henry Wadsworth Long, Longfellow and the abolitionist and future Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner, who also has his own crazy story about getting beaten on the Senate floor for going after a Southern, uh, one of his Southern colleagues whose friend came in, almost killed him with a cane or a stick or something. Anyway, back to the point. <laughs> Julia was taken by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow and future Senator Charles Sumner to visit uh, the New England Institute for the Blind. This was one of the first and most famous uh, schools, later known as the Perkins Institute. They took her there to meet Laura Bridgman, who was a blind and deaf student taught to communicate by the school's director, the school's director being Dr. Samuel Gridley Howe. This was of course the same school that later on, decades later taught Annie Sullivan and Helen Keller. So while Julia and her prominent friends were touring the school, the director, Dr. Howe, who had been out, returned from wherever he was, um, and they could see him coming, riding up on his black horse. She said, a noble rider on a noble steed. Dr. Howe was known to be one good looking guy. He was a heartthrob. All women wanted him, all men wanted to be him. And, Although he was 18 years older than Julia, he had never married. Part of the reason he hadn't married, or what kept him from, mar from marrying for a long time, was that he did a really long stint as a volunteer defender of Greece and its war with the Turks. Where, you know, there he went there for many, many years, um, where his medical training was helpful. He became a war hero, and he was given the title Chevalier of the Order of Saint Savoir. So from then on, his nickname became Chev, short full, short full for Chevalier. So Chev was the man she was to marry. Not immediately after their first meeting, but you know, sometime a little bit later, this courtship began and Julia and Chev were married in 1843 when Julia was 24, which was probably kind of ancient for a woman marrying in those days. <clears throat> 
And although they were both like a really, really good looking couple and they had a strong attraction to one another, there were early signs that this marriage was just not going to be very successful. Despite the fact that Chev was a liberal reformer and an abolitionist and a radical and a progressive, he wasn't progressive at all when it came to marriage. He wanted a traditional wife to support him in his work and fade into the background of domesticity and childbearing. Yet he married the diva, this talented intellectual socialite. She finally realized that her husband was a workaholic and was not, didn't have time and really wasn't interested in spending time with her. He also, which was the biggest sticking point in their marriage, did not approve of her desire to write and publish. He was having none of it. So back in the day, very wealthy American couples took these extraordinarily long, like year long plus honeymoons to Europe. Um, and that's what they did. Um, so it ended up that their first child was born in Rome. Coincidentally, the radical abolitionist uh, Unitarian minister Theodore Parker was also in Rome um, and he was able to christen the baby. He was in Rome because he kind of got kicked out of his Unitarian congregation for being such a radical abolitionist. And he kind of retreated to Europe to sort of lick his wounds and talk about how everybody in the world hated him so much and try to figure out what he would do next. After Julia and Chev's return from Boston, Julia had a pretty rude awakening. Chev insisted that they move into the director's suite at the Institution for the Blind, leaving Julia living in an institution where some of her husband's family members could watch, you know, spy on her and where, you know, living at work, it was not the lifestyle she was accustomed to. It also kept her at an isolated distance as the school was not um, was outside the city limits, out, out, way out on the outskirts of Boston, where she could, you know, actually do things and see people. But on Sundays, she did manage to get to Boston to hear Theodore Parker. Um, he was a very dynamic preacher and famous preacher who had come back from Europe to set up pretty much his own shop, preaching shop outside of Unitarianism, his own independent church that brought it in a music hall that brought in, you know, at least a thousand people to listen him to him every Sunday. Parker became her minister and friend. So eventually Julia's growing family did move to a country home and have a more normal living situation. The house would eventually have a total of five surviving children and Julia loved and doted on her children, but her ambitious, ambitions and interests in life went well beyond child rearing. And when her needs to write and participate in society were stifled, she was absolutely miserable. Because her husband didn't approve of her writing and desire to publish, she started to do it behind his back. The problem was he always found out when she published something, even because even when it was anonymous because everybody knew everybody and just word got around. And it also didn't help that Julia's first published book of poetry was full of thinly disguised poems about a really, really unhappy marriage. Pretty much all of their friends could see right through it, which was pretty embarrassing to her husband. But in her journal, she wrote, I have been married 20 years today. In the course of that time, I have never known my husband to approve of any act of mine, which I myself valued. Books, poems, essays, everything has been contemptible in his eyes because it's not his way of doing things. I am much grieved and disconcerted. Chev also did not come for money and did not have, so he had little money of his own and he didn't earn a little money because he adventured in Greece and then uh, worked at the Institute for the Blind where he had to basically do a lot of fundraising to keep the place open. And, but he had no problem spending Julia Ward Howe's inherit, inheritance. Most of it, a lot of it was spent on bad real and real estate deals, right? So she was really aware of the fact that when a woman, even if she has, whatever she has when she goes into a marriage is really no longer hers. Something that bothered her and something that kind of helped her get involved in the suffragist movement. <clears throat> 
Uh, she and Shev, Shev particularly talked a lot about divorce, but Julia was not willing to do that because she knew she would lose her two older children who favored their father. So she was determined to keep marriage intact together at any cost. She wrote to her sister that Shev's dream was to marry again some young girl who would love him supremely, which I think is really interesting because his own wife was 18 years younger than him. I mean, what was he looking for really, seriously? But she went on to say, I thought it was my real duty to give up everything that was dear and sacred to me rather than be forced to leave two of my children. I made the greatest sacrifice I can ever be called upon to make. So although she talked about the sacrifice of giving up her personal aspirations, I don't think she really stopped. I just think the fight continued. And this you know, went on for years. Julia pushed boundaries and Shev got angry at her publishing and her lecturing and her community activism. That is until Shev, who was an older man, died in 1876. Now the couple managed to uh, reconcile, get, you know, resolve a lot of their issues before his death. Both probably had mellowed over the decades and knowing that his days were numbered, it was probably easier for both of them to be more generous and forgiving. Um, she even wrote a pretty glowing biography of her husband. But now Julia Ward Howe was a 57 year old widow. She had been married for 33 years, but yet she would live 34 more years. She lived to the age of 91. And she was finally, after the death of her husband, really free to do what she wanted to do and be who she wanted to be. She called it, really did call it her new life. She took her youngest daughter and traveled to Europe again and to the Middle East. But back in the States, as she turned 60, she began to take leadership roles in the suffragist movement. Now this was a woman who just did some writing and then did some speaking, but now she was managing people and organizing and producing exhibitions and events relating to women. She also managed to hang out with Oscar Wilde while he was on his American lecture tour. And then kind of coming full circle with the, the Unitarian Women's Sermons in 1882, when she was 63, she wrote the biography of Margaret Fuller. She realized, you know, in the age of the women's suffrage movement that Margaret Fuller's radical work and radical life had a kind of new relevancy I mean, biographies of Margaret had already been written by her friends Emerson and, and William Henry Channing and James Freeman Clark, who was also Julia's friend. But Julia knew that decades later, Fuller's story had to be told again for a new generation. Julia presented Margaret Fuller as the model for the future emancipated woman, writing, as a woman who believed in women, her word is still an evangel of hope and inspiration to her sex. So through the next years, even as she advanced in age, she kept up, Julia kept up a strenuous travel schedule, lecturing, doing readings, um, appearing at events and campaigning for legislation related to women's issues. Although she didn't no longer had her husband to hold her back, her children and grandchildren were really concerned about her health and that she was taking too much on, but it was more chastisement than forbidding. But she got kind of tired of her, her kids and grandkids being on her back about this. So she wrote to her daughter, the past year, which has so much been deplored by some of you, has been to me unusually rich in instruction and in satisfaction. And I, not, I cannot say that I can find any occasion to regret any of its outings. I must make a stand for freedom to do the work which, humanly speaking, I cannot hope to do very much longer. So she was doing all this because she thought her time on earth was running out. But as it turns out, she was able to do the work for a lot more longer than what she thought because she lived a very long life in very good health through most of it. At the beginning of the 20th century, Julia Ward Howe had become a very famous national treasure. She was still growing strong in her 80s and she was still committed to her old causes and she was willing to take on new ones. And her children thought she was nuts. America absolutely 
loved her. She was kind of like Betty White, but with even more like intellectual and historical credibility, right? They just loved her. She toured the Midwest. She appeared at a benefit at the Tuskegee Institute. She met W.E.B. Du Bois, Booker T. Washington. She supported racial integration of women's clubs and spoke out against lynching. As a result, she got some pretty rough hate mail from the South. At times, her, she was so famous that it really got in the way. People were always writing and asking for things. People tried to exploit her, but there are no indications she fell for any of it. She became involved with more issues. Abolition of the death penalty, protection of Italian immigrants, Indian affairs, and a Pennsylvania coal miner strike. She was awarded with honorary degrees. At age 90, she was still writing poetry and pestering her daughter to let her make public appearances. This woman did not shy away from the limelight. But she eventually, eventually at 91, she died from pneumonia. It was 1910, and it was only a week after, after getting her third honorary degree. This one was from Smith College. So in her later years, Julia Ward Howe took full advantage of her freedom and she used it pretty much for the greater good. She used her power struggles with her husband as a lesson. You know, as lessons, she stepped out to claim her own voice and her own power as a spokesperson for women's rights, having experienced a lack of rights herself. And then going beyond speaking just for women's rights, but then speaking out for the disempowered everywhere. So on this Mother's Day, this day of Hallmark cards and flowers and all those nice things, keep in mind that Mother's Day, there's a power and a toughness behind Mother's Day that it can mean so much more. Please remember and be reminded that mothers have power and they can use their particular life experience and their particular viewpoint to change the world. May it be so, blessed be, and happy Mother's Day. <laughs>